uh, the removed the faults and cares and struggles of the world and give the next hour to thee. That is that uh, we will give our heart, our soul, and our mind as we meditate upon thy word, as we take the lesson, Father, as we ask it and examine our lives, uh, how we can become better, what will our, acknowledge our areas where we're weak and, uh, and correct them and to continue to, to grow and, and hopefully be strengthened uh, by the lesson this morning that is found within in thy word. Father, we uh, do pray that you would continue to, to be with all of our efforts here at Skyline, be with our elders during a difficult time, uh, that they may continue to guide us down the path of persuasion to the right. Father, we uh, always ask thy forgiveness find ourselves uh, uh, short. We're so very uh, thankful for her liking and for her willingness to, to be obedient uh, to the gospel call, to have her sins washed away uh, through the water grave of baptism this past week. We're so thankful for that and we pray for her life uh, in the future moving moving forward. And we pray that we can all be unto her um, uh, that example. Just as we all look to Christ, that we may continue to, to teach, that we may continue to, to be a friend and uh, to, to help to guide and strengthen us all. Father, we all look to uh, to one another for, for guidance and for strength at times. And hopefully, Father, as a spiritual family, we can all be there for one another and lean upon one another in difficult times and to help to encourage, to keep fighting on, to keep running the race, Father, which you said for us. Please go with us now for this hour of worship. We pray all these things through our mediator. Amen. Please sing, please. In a few minutes, we're going to turn the services over to Brother Morgan and bring our lesson to us. You will mark your song books as invitation song 255. 255. We'll sing that directly after the sermon. The song before the sermon this morning will be 785. 785. We'll sing all three verses. Seven eighty-five. There's a wonderful place we call home. Tis a city of glory divine. It is built in the garden of rest, and the beautiful home shall be mine. Oh, the wonderful region <coughs> so blessed, where Jesus the Master has gone to prepare us this glorious home. I think in the distance. 
speaks to my soul it will be to behold such a glorious sight where the sun and the moon neither shine but the glory of God is alive. Oh, wonderful city of God, just a cross in that beautiful fire. the angels sleep and go up so in musical cadence it shines. Oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see. This morning, appreciate each of you being here uh, as well. And so, yes, we we can't wait for Luke and the crew to, to, to make it back in. We are waiting anxiously, awaiting them uh, here, and it's a fantastic kind of. Uh, thank you also to to Aaron and to others who have contributed to Lake of Baptism. I know it takes a. Uh, it takes quite a few people many times to, to bring everything together for that. And so uh, each of you are to be very, uh, very proud of your work done there. Call your attention to uh, Genesis 4, starting there in verse uh, 3 this morning as we begin our lesson. Genesis 4, starting there in verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance failed? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you but you shall rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain arose against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Because of what happened, Cain became angry. Now Cain didn't have to become angry. But he chose to become angry, and he got angry at Abel. Cain was told by God, you better be careful. You better be careful because basically anger here was the front porch to something more sinister that may happen. God says sin lies at the door. Sin is closed. And here's another thing I'll tell you. Sin has its desire over you. Sin lies at the door and sin wants you. Now the better choice, Cain, is for you to rule over sin. Sin lies at the door. Sin wants you, but you rule over sin. However, Cain failed, and sin won out. Anger, jealousy, being upset, all of these things evidently severed, which turned into hatred, and that hatred turned into murder. Into murder. Sin lies at the door. No wonder in Matthew 5, 21, Jesus said, you shall not, or you have heard that you shall not murder, but I say to you, do not become angry. Do not become angry. Why? Because you see, there's a front door to other sins. One sin leads to others. Within my lifetime, I have seen anger that uh, 
has developed into hatred. And then later this hatred has moved into murder. I was brought up in the days of segregation when we had segregated schools, segregated restaurants, segregated uh, lunch counters, segregated doctor's offices even, segregated restrooms, segregated stores, and even segregated drinking fountains. I've attended segregated movies where it cost Joyce and I 25 cents to get in, but others paid 10 cents if they went to another door and went up to the balcony. I've seen and walked through doors marked whites only while there was another door there right next to it marked color. The supervisory FBI agent who headed up the federal response to the integration of Ole Miss lived in my hometown. And he actually was the main speaker at my graduation. And I've heard him describe the volatile crowds that were filled with, with, with anger and hatred. Myself as the president for public schools there in Greenwood, I defended the public school system for years while, while facing anger and hatred from certain whites. Uh, later on within my job, I had to interview on more than one occasion an individual charged and, and, and later convicted of the death of a well-known civil rights leader. Doris and I have lived some 50 years of our life within an area where we were the minority race. Yes, I've seen anger. I've seen hatred up close and firsthand. And folks, whether we are willing to admit it or not, unfortunately, within our nation today, too many of our fellow citizens are seething with anger and hate. This past year, all of us have, have seen that many of our friends, neighbors, and fellow citizens have experienced firsthand anger and hate up close. Anger and hate of and between political parties. Anger and hate of and between politicians. Anger and hate between red and blue states. Anger and hate of the police. Anger and hate of the military. Anger and hate of white folks. Anger and hate of, 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 of African Americans, anger and hate of the Jews, anger and hate of, of homosexuals, anger and hate of our own country itself. And yes, anger and hate of Jesus Christ and God. Within this past year, we've been shocked, shocked to the core with what we've seen, the riots in our cities, individuals, their lives lost, policemen brutalized and killed, businesses ransacked, burned to the ground, churches set on fire while individuals cheered. We've all seen this. We've all gone through this. And due to what's happening right now within our country, it just seems like we've got a lot of anger and hatred all around us. And we have to recognize what's happening in order for us to protect ourselves, all right? In order that we not fall victim to this toxic attitude all around us. Each one of us will have to make a decision as to how we're going to react. We're going to have to make a decision as to how best we move forward within our own selves, within our own families, within our own spiritual family, how are we going to put our best foot forward? What are we going to tell our kids? How are we going to explain all of this to our kids? How are we going to live with ourselves and live 
peaceably with others, given the situation that we find ourselves in. As Christians, I certainly believe that we must instruct our families in the truth found in God's Word. And we have to remind ourselves of what God expects of us. Psalms 37, verse 8, instructs us, cease from anger and forsake wrath. And this is in the Old Testament Psalms. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Colossians 3, 8, over in the New Testament, says, but now put aside anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech. Therefore, we have the admonition to not be angry both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And the reason given is this. James 1.20 says the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I believe we understand that, okay? The, the, the anger of man turns out to be more concerned with, with ourselves. The anger of man turns out to be, hey, how have you treated me? The, the, the anger of man turns out to be more personal than with God. We do get, get angrier, it seems, over, over slighted feelings and pride. Oh, that balls us up. Somebody hurts my pride. Balls it up. Somebody corrects us. Balls us up if somebody says something in the wrong tone. You know, we get angry. We get angry over minor inconveniences. We get angry when we don't get our way. We're old enough to know this. But the anger of man usually produces quarreling, jealousy, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, disorder. Everything mentioned there in 2 Corinthians 12 20. And then if that's not enough, we can jump over to Galatians 5 20. Uh, anger again produces enmity, strife, tantrums, dissensions, divisions. Factions. So it's pretty straightforward, folks. You know, the Bible teaches that anger is wrong. But I must admit that I have become angry. And just maybe you have become angry too. See, I have become angry at just the sound of the voice of some politicians. I became angry when I saw the, the riots of last summer in Washington and Oregon. I became angry when I saw the chaos and the mayhem around the country and all of the cities that were set on fire. I became angry when, when I saw the obvious police brutality. I became angry, yes, when I saw that policeman's knee on that person's neck. I, I became angry. I became angry when I saw the despicable behavior of individuals towards others. I became angry the last week, two weeks ago or so, when I saw the U.S. Capitol invaded. And I became angry when my candidate for president didn't get elected. So with all that, and since I admit that I became angry, then I guess I better respond to the Lord's invitation today. Right? Well, maybe not. Because you see, the, the, the particulars are all in the details. We find the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.26 
which is really a recantation of what's in Psalms 4.4. 4. Apostle Paul says, be angry, yet do not sin. If we are told to be angry and, and do not sin, then this obviously means that some things, some things that make us angry must not be sin. I know it has confused many in the past. It, it, it may confuse many of you here today. Do not get angry. On one hand. On the other, be angry. Yet do not sin. How do you reconcile this? What do we as Christians do? What do you do? What have you thought about this in the past? If you've ever thought about it, I don't know. We see in Psalms 103.8 and in a dozen plus other verses uh, in the Old Testament, this psalm, Psalm 103.8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. And then in 2 Peter 3.9, we find Peter saying, the Lord is not slow about his promise, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish. Again, we have here, the Lord is patient. The Lord is slow to anger. Slow to anger does not mean that God will not get angry. As we study the Bible, we find that, that, that God has given us laws, God has given us commands, God has given us a way of life that he prefers over other ways of life. He, he gives us little hints and details and instructions as to how he wants us to live our lives and, and, and how he wants to be worshipped and and how he wants us to act. He gives us all of these instructions because he loves us, of course. And he has shown that in the sending of the Son. And he asks of, of us very few things, really. And when we fail to, to live up to these expectations, when we fail to obey these commands, when we fail to... to, to to look to him for guidance. While he may be patient, ultimately he gets angry at what can be considered a perversion of his goodness and a perversion of his righteousness. Because you see, those things that God has given to us, those things that God has instructed us in is the better path and when we move from that path, when we do things out of uh, disobedience, out of rebellion, out of whatever, when we move from that path, God will get angry with us eventually if we don't mend our ways and come back to him. It's in these times of the Lord's anger, okay, we learn that his anger is really a byproduct of our behavior, of our action, of our dealing with him as our father. God's anger is a byproduct of, of his goodness, of his righteousness, of how he wants things, of how of what he, what his desires are of us. So when we are told to be angry, carries with it the idea we are to be angered over what makes God angry. That should make us angry. All the while remembering 
not to sin. See, we can't use our anger as that front door, front porch to sin. We have to be careful. We have to understand what, what we're doing. God tells us, remove all anger. But then he says, be angry. What are we going to be angry at? We're going to be angry. Angry. And what causes God to get angry? That's what we're going to get angry about. We're going to be angry over, over evil that, that profanes God's holiness. And folks, we see that a lot within our society. And we should get angry at that. We're to be angry over anything that perverts his goodness or that solves his righteousness. We should become angry at that. And yet do not sin. We are to get angry over what causes God to get angry. Now keep in mind, this is, a, this is distinct and different then what we're taught in Colossians, it tells us to, to, to be not angry, you see. That deals with the anger of man. That deals with me getting upset because you, you use the wrong tone of voice with me. Are we getting upset because, oh, you corrected me. See, that's totally different. The anger in one verse versus the anger in another verse. We come to recognize, or should come to recognize, and I want you to try to recognize that not all anger that we as Christians experience is rooted in the prideful, selfish, sinful actions of us as human beings. Yes, I became angry, okay, but I truthfully admit that my anger did not progress into a, a hatred of individuals personally. I became anger, angry at the actions of individuals and the actions of, 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 of what caused things to happen. My anger, my frustration, my displeasure was directed at the behavior Of individuals or beliefs of individuals. With these thoughts and beliefs, placing them in direct opposition to God's instructions. I became angry and still become angry at the ungodly political positions taken by certain politicians. I'll just throw one out. If you don't become angry, at abortion, something's wrong. If you don't become angry that we can't, can't pray to our God and Father on government property, something's wrong. And I could list lots of political positions of certain politicians that cause me to get angry. Am I mad at that particular politician? No, I'm not mad. Do I get angry with him as a person? No. But that person believes and he, he, he tries to do things, implement things, and pass laws that force me into doing something different than what God has told me to do. That's what I become angry with, and that's what I hope you become angry with, too. I became angry at, at, at seeing the destruction of a person's lifelong work being destroyed by others. I know what would have happened if, if someone had thrown a torch through my dad's business, all right? And I had to sit there and see it burn up because my dad... He didn't believe in carrying a lot of insurance. He, he just believed, you know, you can become insurance poor and he'd rather at times take his chances and stuff. Not me, but 
but my dad would. And, and so I can, I can understand the frustration, let's say, of a businessman who, who sees the actions of individuals that, that, that totally ransack and, and burn his business. Individuals, many times, who... who would rather not hold a job. Now, I don't, I don't hate that individual, but I don't like their behavior. I don't like how they think. And I wish we could change it, and we could. They could, and we'll get to that a little later. But, but I became angry at the, at the destruction of property that I helped pay for, that you helped pay for. When you saw all those monuments being pulled down, you helped pay for those folks. That was wrong. That was against the law. That was that uh, it was it was against God's law. That should make you angry at that person. No, at the actions and behavior of these individuals. See, we can make a distinct difference. Now I know there are individuals out there that can't. But you see, we should be on a little bit higher level and we should be able to, to, to distinguish between that because you see, that's the difference in anger in Colossians and the difference in anger in Ephesians. I became angry at individuals throwing away and wrecking what God has so graciously given to us. It may be that given what has happened, uh, you've already been affected in some negative way. It may be that you find yourself having to deal with your emotions of, uh, of disappointment, of frustration, despondency, and anger. And it may be, may be that, that, that these descriptions, these actions, this behavior has served as the front porch to hatred. To assist us this morning, let's, let's go back to the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, 6. <clears throat> there in verse, uh, verse 6. So the Lord uh, said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you angry? Obviously, God knew what had transpired. God saw it. God knew the situation surrounding Cain's anger. But God asked him that question. Why are you angry? And, and, and in other words, he says, Cain, why have you chosen to be angry? Cain, why have you allowed yourself to be angry? Cain, was my reprimand to you so harsh that it has caused you to be this angry? God even goes further than that. He says, and why has your countenance fallen? You ever notice that? Cain, okay, your anger has changed you. Your anger has caused you to be a different person. Cain, okay, you don't seem to be happy. You seem to have a frown on your face. Cain, why is your countenance falling? I can tell a difference. You're a totally different person. And this is a whole other lesson we could, we could get into. God then tells Cain, if you do well, won't you be accepted? Cain, despite your failure to obey, Despite you getting angry at something you shouldn't have got angry about, you can still come back to me. Nothing's stopping you. You can still reestablish a, a proper relationship with me. In other words, Cain, if you do right, if you obey me, if you look to me, Cain, if you get your attitude right, Cain, if you get your heart right, if you have no hatred, if you have no malice, if you have no ill will, if you listen to me, 
you know, you can we can re reestablish that that close personal relationship. And if we do, won't your life be acceptable? Won't your offerings be acceptable? Won't your actions be responsible? God tries to, tries to uplift him there. God tries to provide that good path for him, you see. But then God says this too. If you do not do well, if you continue in the, the, what you're doing, if you continue in that path that you're headed down, sin lies at the door. Sin is close. Sin is waiting. Sin is chomping at a chance to get him. Sin wants to take you down, Cain. Sin's desire is for you. Now here's the, here's the challenge for Cain, and here's the challenge for us as well as we live our lives. Cain uh, God informs Cain. Yes, sin's desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. You shall rule over it. Cain, it's possible for you to back off your anger. It's possible for you, since you do have a choice. Cain, yes, you can beat this thing. Cain, it's up to you. You've got to want it. And this morning, God's throwing that gauntlet down to us as well. We have a choice. We have a choice. We can rule over our anger. We can rule over our whatever sin it might be. Hatred. We can we can have differences between each other that cause us to, to, to be rude with each other, that cause us to, to fight, that causes us to, to, to really tear one another apart or tear the family apart or tear the spiritual family apart. We could, we could have all of these type behavioral actions and allow that sin to rule, or we can make a choice to rule over sin. Just like God told Cain he could do. The choice is ours. But since the days of Adam and Eve, Satan, Satan, has been very successful in infiltrating. And today we can observe Satan's rule over the minds of individuals all over our country, all over the world even. We can, we can see Satan having control over the minds of, of, of individuals within our own families that's causing them to sin, that's causing them to push away from God. We know people who have who have allowed sin to rule over them rather than them ruling over sin. So we must understand that our fight is not with our fellow man, all right? But our fight for our better tomorrow is with Satan. Is with Satan. That's why an election of a certain man or woman will not suddenly stop. Uh, all of the hatred we have within our country. Won't do it. Uh, it will not stop all of the murders uh, that occurs up in Chicago every day and every weekend. Or the stores and businesses from being van uh, vandalized and burned. It won't stop the robberies, the crime. The Apostle Paul informs us here that what the root is 
Ephesians 6, 12, his clip of red. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, man, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Satan. That's where the struggle is. And Paul says the struggle is that we have, we're up against a very powerful foe. Very powerful adversary. Who's determined to, to devour our country. Who's determined to, to, to bring havoc, okay, to our nation and havoc to our communities. And sometimes havoc to our spiritual families. This foe, Satan, wants to break up our families. This Satan wants to do as much damage as he can to us personally as well as to our family members. The only way to really confront and defeat these evil forces, the only way to really bring an end to the violence, anger, and hatred within the world, the only way to heal our families, the only way for us individually to have real peace, for us is for us to look to God's word for guidance and instruction. We must look to God's way. We must make a decision to obey, and then we must make a, a decision to follow Jesus Christ. A submission to Jesus is the only answer to pain within our nation, within our family. It is the only answer to cure that division that we seem to have and hostility that we seem to have and the anger that seems to be all around us. A submission to Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. As we close, let's remember what God told Cain. Sin lies at the door. And I don't know what your sin is that may be eating at you, that maybe Satan is using to, to cause you to, to sin. I don't know what that is. But whatever it is, God says you can rule over it. You can rule over it. But we must remember, though, that Satan, his desire is for that sin to rule you. And you have a choice, just like Cain had a choice. You can get angry, you can, you can submit to that sin, just like Cain did. Or you don't have to, just like God said, it's an option for Cain. You must rule over sin, no matter what it is. We can try it. It's only in that triumph is where we'll find peace with yourself, with your family, within our nation, with each other. If we can help you this morning, if, if there's something within your life going on that you need the prayers of the spiritual family for, we'll be glad to pray for you and help you out all we can. For some reason, you've studied and you you understand that God's instruction has for us to be baptized and arise and walk as a new person in Him. We can assist you with that. If for any reason we can help you this morning, come forward now. While we stand, we can say, I have risen no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are
forward uh, this morning saying that she's just the, the situation that, that she's contending with right now that uh, at, at times uh, she has uh, really done and maybe said some things in, in, during this situation that she might not have uh, should have said and it's just uh, nerves get frazzled nerves get stretched and and things happen and um, of course that's that's the way the devil is the devil is waiting to let you know just hoping that we're going to do these type things but at the same time I know over these past three or four years uh, uh, Pam has shown to Joyce and I uh, the traits of a very godly woman. And uh, she fights a, a brave battle. Not only for her immediate family, but, but she fights for, for others within this congregation as well. And so Charlotte comes forward and she says she's allowed sin to rule over her life rather than her uh, ruling over sin and she wants to, to rule over sin. And that's what we want for her and for each one of us as well. Let's go to God in prayer, please. Father, we thank you so much for our Christian family here. We thank you, Father, for the love and support that we, we have for one another as we look to you with our love and ask for your guidance. Father, as we come before you, we ask that you forgive us of our sins so that we might uh, become, uh, come before you uh, holy and sanctified so that you will uh, give heed to our prayers. And we ask first, uh, now, Father, that you would uh, bless Pam, forgive her, of whatever sins that, that she might have in her life, or whatever shortcomings, Father, that she seems to think that, that, that she has had. We just ask, Father, that, that you would help her uh, as she uh, moves through this, this time of her life. Father, we just ask for success uh, as we all try to help and uh, move through this uh, serious and stressful and troublesome time that she's going through as well as uh, her whole family. Father, we just ask for your uh, help, your uh, support, and uh, your guidance as we all try to do things that, that we think that will help or that we think that will 
right direction. We thank you, Father, for the love that you have for this congregation, for the love that you have for each one of us, all the things that you've done for us. We just uh, don't know what we do uh, without her, without her life of service to you. We thank you for her. Uh, Father, too, we thank you for Charlie. We thank you for her uh, coming to us and being here and worshiping with us. Uh, Father, we just uh, ask that you would help her in her life as she lives, help her to uh, be the uh, proper example that she should be, help her be able to, to have the strength and the courage and the tenacity to, to rule over whatever sin may, may come her way. Give her the strength that she needs, Father, give her the ability to look to you for help. Father, we ask for help that, that we be able rise to the occasion to help her overcome uh, these sinful uh, things that, that's trying to bring her down as well. Father, this time I pray for each one of us as we have those things within our lives that are, that are weighing us down, those things that are stopping us from being acceptable to you. And we pray, Father, that, that we have the strength to remove them. Come to the next part of our worship service, observing of the Lord's Supper. I hope that you'll turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. One of the things that I've found so fascinating about uh, about the Bible, and I believe that it shows us uh, just the the infinite wisdom, the you know almighty power that God has, is that we could go all the way back to the beginning of the world, the creation of this world, and, and Adam and Eve, and we can see the scheme of redemption was planned by God even from that time. And I, I think it's so fascinating and interesting as, as we read through the Old Testament, we see that everything, uh, as we're going through God's Word, everything's pointing towards Jesus. And, and it's one of the, it's just, it's so amazing to me. And we, we see all these prophecies, and I want to notice one of those prophecies this morning here in Isaiah chapter 53. And we'll look, and, and there's, he's prophesying about one day Jesus Christ coming to, to save us from our sins. He begins in verse 3, and he says, He is despised and rejected by men. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And then you see over in verse 12, it says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul into death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now look over in Mark, the book of Mark in the New Testament, as we see this prophecy come to life. Mark chapter 15, uh, beginning about verse 16, we see that then the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole uh, garrison. They clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and 
bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and uh, he, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is translated place of the school. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on uh, his left. In verse 28, so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So we see the fulfillment of the prophecy that we just read in Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, over in verse 37 of Mark 15, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. And so as we come to this part of our worship service and we kind of direct our minds and our thoughts towards Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us, I, I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus, even though he was deity and he was God, he, he came to this earth, and he lived a perfect life. Lived a perfect life, yet when he was crucified and, and when it came down to it, he was accused just as, as other transgressors, as one who had transgressed the law, as one who had committed many crimes. So I think it's important for us to remember that as, as we go into part, this part of our worship and we think back and we examine and observe the Lord's Supper. Amen. Turn to Psalm 452. 452. Psalms help reflect our minds back on that sacrifice. And this psalm speaks at, uh, volumes of the agony that Christ uh, endured on our behalf, but it also speaks volumes about the lesson that Brother Norman preached today. He dealt with his own anger at a time that he should have been, could have been very angry. Uh, so all three verses. Night with
bow and pray with me. Our God and our Father in heaven, it is our privilege now, Father, to gather around your table, take of your dinner. Father, this hymn will disperse the bread, which represents our son's body, that was nailed to that cruel cross of Calvary. We pray, Father, we partake of this bread in a manner we'll please you indeed. In remembrance to you, Father, to you return again. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we once again bow before you, thanking you for these emblems. We thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood that was shed. Our forgiveness of the sins that cleanses us in such a way that you gratefully bestowed on us. Lord, we thank you for it and we pray that we take it in a manner that is well pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord's Supper is concluded. God and our Father who art in heaven is through thy infinite wisdom and knowledge and grace that we as children of yours are able to live our lives each day. It's also through your knowledge, Father, that you have uh, seen fit to provide ways for us to provide for a living, the things that we have, the things that we enjoy in life, and life itself. We know, Heavenly Father, that we uh, are commanded to give back for those things and say that we love you and we're so thankful uh, for the things that we have. We pray now, Father, as we give a part back to these things for the, the needs of the church and other things that come up that we will give cheerfully and from a heart, not out of necessity, knowing that all things do come from above. And we know about, Father, if we give, if we've been prospered, that the blessings will continue to flow. We thank thee for, all, for everything. I just wanted to announce a couple of things. Uh, Paige and I have kind of been working on uh, getting some stuff up. I, I've been trying to think, and I know Paige reached out to some of you moms, I think, uh, trying to get something for our PB&J juniors, for the younger kids, uh, to, to have them you know, be able to work on something throughout the week as well. Uh, so we've come up with kind of a little packet deal, and uh, also we're going to Today, starting today, we're going to have our pew packers again. We're going to start that up, having that every Sunday morning after our worship service. And so on our little packet, we've got a memory verse for every week. And parents, I want to encourage you to, uh, and I'll be honest, uh, we've got a memory work and Bible study, uh, things like that. And, and parents, you're going to have to help them, you know. And, and I didn't put the Bible passage for our Bible study because I really want to encourage you to, to get the Bibles out at home actually turn to the passage and, and read it with them. Have them to read it if they can. If not, you can read it to them. And I've got several questions, uh, four or five questions for the young young ones and, and even a couple extra challenging questions for, for the bigger kids. Uh, we've got an activity just for a, a coloring sheet for the, the toddlers and, uh, and some, uh, for our older kids. I've, I've got a, uh, a couple of activities for them to do 
in which they'll kind of draw their own picture related to whatever topic it is for that work week and, uh, and, and maybe even write a letter uh, with that. And so I've got all that together. And our memory verse, what we're going to do, and so this week's memory verse is going to be Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. And so I'll try to send a, a group me out, you know, once a week, reminding all of you to, to make sure to do the Bible study and the memory work, uh, verse, work on that with them. Uh, and then when we come in and after our worship service on Sunday mornings, uh, the first thing we'll do for our pew packers is go over our memory verse together. Uh, and so I thought that'd be kind of neat. Also, for our teens, uh, we are still having our Zoom, so parents, I want to encourage you to, to make sure you are, are pushing your kids to, to get on there with us uh, each Wednesday night, same time as the adult class, 630. Uh, we get on and, and we'll have several good discussions. We actually are starting a new, uh, starting a new class topic uh, in which we're going through and looking at, at uh, different Bible characters, and we're calling it, I actually uh, got this idea from Cody Harden, many of you may know him, uh, calling it the manliest man of the Bible, and so we're kind of going, putting two up against each other each week, and we're going to try to decide based on what we can read from them, you know, how manly they were, I guess you'd say, and, and we get to really kind of look at and, and see what uh, God used them for, you know, in their lives as well. Uh, but along with that, for our teens, I'm going to send out a uh, text. We have a we have a group text that we use a good bit. I'm going to send a picture of a, a devotional every Monday night, and uh, just just kind of as a as a something that'll be a little extra for them, a little Bible study that they can do on their own time as well. And so parents encourage them to be doing that uh, as well. Last thing I'll say is, uh, obviously, you know, last year we had worked hard, didn't get to go to last the leaders, not going to be able to go this year as well, uh, but I'm, me, me and Paige are trying to work something up, we're trying to think of some ways that, you know, those who had speeches prepared that we could uh, at, at least, you know, give those speeches uh, in some form or fashion and we can still hand out the, uh, hand out our awards that we've got. I've got a box with those. Uh, you know, uh, it's just been kind of weird not being able to be here, and, and so I don't know if we'll be able to have the, the normal awards uh, deal that we usually have, but, but we're trying to figure out something, and maybe even kind of work up our own, you know, leadership um, deal that, that we can get going here, and, and just encouraging our kids to, you know, practice their song leading, practice, you know, coming up with Bible studies, and, and that kind of thing, that way we can you know, train them now, that way later on in life they'll, they'll be willing to uh, teach Bible class, maybe even get up and preach, you know, do uh, ladies' days, uh, do the ladies' devotionals that, that we have all the time, and, and, and so we want to encourage them to, to be uh, prepared and trained to do that one day. So uh, be looking forward to that, but uh, parents, if you'll just make sure that your kids get one of these for this week for our PBJ juniors, uh, and, and the teens be looking out for our uh, weekly devotional. Thank you. We're going to turn the song books back to 669. It's in the last verse. We appreciate you on the moment. It's a blessing today. We appreciate everybody that's here today, especially our visitors. And if you are visiting, we ask that you uh, come back to see us again. Stick around for a minute to get the meeting. Anything else that needs to be announced? Not much. It's in the last verse, 669. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems also strong, God is the
again, we're just so grateful for the opportunity, the privilege that we've had this morning to assemble together and to worship you. Dear Lord, we pray that everything that we've done this morning has been uh, very pleasing to you, has uh, been acceptable in your sight. Dear Lord, I pray that we have uh, prayed, we've sang these songs, dear Lord, that we've studied, and uh, through all these acts of worship that we have done so in spirit and in truth, that we have uh, focused our minds on worshiping you, giving you all glory and honor and praise uh, that you deserve. Dear Lord, we uh, are so grateful for Lakin and for her decision to put on Christ in baptism, dear Lord, and we, we're glad to uh, welcome her to the, the church family, dear Lord. And we pray that we can encourage her and be there with her every step of the way through this Christian life. Dear Lord, we do pray, uh, and, and we are so grateful for, for Pam and for Charlie both of, as they have come before us today and just been such great examples. And I pray that you'll be with them uh, as they're struggling with, with different things in their lives. I pray that we can uh, be that, that Christian friend that they need, that that. Christian family that they need that will be by their side and will help them through whatever they may be dealing with. Uh, dear Lord, we just pray that you will be with all of us in our everyday lives as, as we go about. We leave here today and uh, we just go back tomorrow entering into wherever we may work or going back to school, just going back into the world. And, and there's so much darkness out there, dear Lord. And as Norman mentioned this morning, uh, Satan is, is just doing everything he can to, to pry at us, to get us to fail. But I pray that we'll stand strong, that we'll overcome any temptations that we may face, that we'll be doing the things within our lives, studying your word, praying to you, and, and putting ourselves in, in those better atmospheres just so that we can uh, be better Christians, that we'll grow. Dear Lord, we, uh, we do pray that uh, when, we, when we look at the sinful things of this world and the the worldly things that will have a, a sense of disgust towards those things, but uh, but that whenever we face such things that we will have the, the self-control to, to be angry but to not sin. But instead, dear Lord, I pray that we'll pour every effort into uh, doing whatever we can to, to change the world and, and that, we'll, that we'll live in such a way that we'll shine our lights and uh, that we can, uh, that you'll be seen in us and that we can lead others to you. And dear Lord, uh, we, we just are so grateful for Jesus Christ and, and for all that he has done for us and that sacrifice. And we do pray that you'll uh, forgive us when we do fail you. Pray that you'll just be with us as we leave here this morning and just keep us safe. Uh, and it's in Christ's name. Amen.